I'd like to show you another game from the matches played between Alpha Zero, the deep mind reinforcement learning machine, and Stockfish, one of the best chess engines in the world. And this game really illustrates the, the leaning towards attack that Alpha Zero has. It is quite extraordinary. It's play in this game reminds me of the kind of guy you'd play down the pub who's had a couple of pints and just goes, oh, whatever, let's go for the attack. Uh, but of course, in Alpha Zero's case, it's backed up by a little bit more than alcohol. Well, we hope so anyway. Um, so without further ado, Stockfish is playing white. Now, this game uh, was not played from a set position, and I'm guessing that it wasn't played with recourse to opening books either. Well, certainly Alpha Zero doesn't use uh, an opening book. It's completely self-taught. It formulates it formulated its own rules in in the, the training phase. Um, whereas Stockfish, in some of the games in this match, uh, used an opening book. In some of them, it didn't. I'm guessing in this game, it didn't use an opening book, but I I don't know. So it starts off as a Gioco Piano, uh, although as we're going to see, it very quickly turns into into a Gioco Forte. Um, so, yeah, Gioco Piano so far, but now a6, well, this move actually has a great bearing on the game because it allows the bishop to just tuck itself away on a7. This idea is very popular at elite levels in, in modern day chess, uh, and it could easily transpose after c3 or castles and then d6 uh, and so on. But here Stockfish is the first to, to send the game into slightly unusual paths. It plays knight g5, an incredibly crude move, threatening f7. However, in this case, there is uh, more to this than meets the eye because it's rather awkward for black to defend the pawn and alpha zero has to play knight h6 to defend f7, which of course is not the ideal square for the knight. However, watch how Alpha Zero manages to make the most of this. So normal, sort of normal after that. And now certainly black is, is getting towards threatening knight a5 to bag that bishop. So that's why Stockfish played a4 to make sure the bishop has a safe square to retreat to. Bishop g4, so it's a little bit awkward for the queen because it doesn't really want to step up to d2, blocking the bishop. And if it goes to e1, then knight d4 will happen to attack here. So it drops the knight back to f3. So the early sortie has come to nothing except that this knight is, well, on a slightly odd square on h6. I'm not going to say a poor square because watch what happens. So here, if... Um, Alpha Zero wanted to, it's possible to play the knight back to g8 and then back to f6, and we've got a fairly normal position on the board. Um, but instead, it just castles here, not fearing bishop h6, which happens in a second, and we'll see why. h3, of course not, taking on f3, that would be a kind of capitulation. The bishop maintains the pin. And c3 to stop the knight coming into d4. And now we start to get an idea of what alpha zero is about. It's looking to justify the position of the knight on h6. Otherwise, it would have played knight g8 early. It plays king h8. So the basic idea is that the king steps out of the way of the bishop and that allows black to play f5. And then everything makes sense. The early attack on the f-file is extremely dangerous. Um, so, well, already it, it's tricky for white. You know, you can't avoid an attack here, but you can try and manage it. Well, Stockfish takes on h6. Excuse me one second. 
So the pawns are damaged, but of course with the king on h8 there is potential to attack down here. Knight d2, reinforcing, and bishop a7. So the bishop just removes itself into the corner, so preempting any strike with uh, b4 or d4. And here's a very interesting moment in the game because what I would love to do with white in this position is actually get a clamp on the king side and play g4 because this might be a way of gaining control over these squares. You know, what I'd like to do is rook h1, knight round to g3. But actually, well, both entities here must have appreciated that actually black is able to get very good play on the king's side. Now, just when it looks as though white is about to gain control here, knight d8 is a really strong move, aiming for f4, and the game turns in black's favour. Obviously, if that's captured, then uh, pawn takes and, and, the, and, and the pawn covers f5 and the f-file opens, so that would be great fun for black. So that's not possible. So Stockfish finds another move that attempts to keep some control over the position. So bishop d5, and I'm guessing that its idea might have been after f5 to simply take on c6. Now that knocks out uh, potentially dangerous knight, and then I'm guessing it would have calculated quite deeply g4, which will win a piece. Now black does have some compensation here, but basically white can defend in, in the usual way, f4, and then the queen comes to e2, and as usual, if you can defend along the second rank, that's very important. And white's coordination is good enough. Now, black still has compensation here, but white is pretty well coordinated and, well, should should survive that one. So I'm guessing that was the idea behind bishop d5. Black could still play rook g8 and queen f6 here. That's possible. But alpha zero's idea in this position is absolutely outrageous. It really is. It's just... It's so brutal. Knight e7. Now this just swings the knight round to the king side. Gives up the pawn on b7. Gives up the pawn on a6. So just abandons the queen side, basically, in order to just push on, on the king side. It's amazing. It uh, Just no qualms at all. Now, obviously, this is starting to look pretty dangerous with threats on f3 and this bishop lurking in the wings. It does like its two bishops. I think we've seen this from uh, from all the games we've seen so far, actually, that this is a very common theme. Bishops. Loves the two bishops. So, king h1. And now, again, a very unmaterialistic move. It simply continues with the attack with knight g6. It's possible to take that pawn and get one of the pawns back and just go back with the rook. But that's an investment of time. Now white has time to try and find some uh, a defense on the king side. Instead of taking here, alpha zero just keeps that one hanging. Instead just carries on, knight g6. It is so direct. That's what's impressive. And after taking, well, be careful because it could still be possible to play g4. But knight f4, let's just keep going. And if g4 here, then we can take on h3 and take on f5. And black has tremendous compensation there. So we've got, well, certainly four pieces about to enter the attack there. And this is a very different case to the one we just looked at because the communication with white's pieces is not very good here. You can see the second rank isn't open, so the queen can't defend across. So knight f4 just played d4, 
to shut out the bishop on a7, understandable, and get some pressure here. Rook takes pawn. And once again, g4 is a move that has to be considered. Well, I'm sure the uh, machines, uh, well, of course they considered it, but it was rejected um, because black has tremendous compensation here. Here's an interesting moment, knight d3. This is just for fun, this didn't happen. But I, I wanted to show you this. You can see threat of mate. And now rook b takes b2. Finally, this pawn is taken with more pressure here. Um, I mean, it's, it's actually a very unclear variation, but um, black is certainly has some fun there. A bit more than fun, actually. Queen c2. Attacking... The rook, which went back. Rook e1. So Stockfish is coordinating pretty well. It has some pressure here. And this move is really nice. Queen f6. So I'm sure this was appreciated some moves before, that the queen is actually looking at that bishop, which is loose, um, as well, of course, as, as the obvious threat of taking one of these pawns and capturing on f3. But I just think it's really interesting. I'm sure that would have... Uh, come into it, well, thoughts is perhaps too strong a word, um, that this bishop was loose and that it, that it felt that this was uh, a reasonable way to play to give up these pawns. So yes, if pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, queen threatens the bishop as well as taking one of these pawns on the king side. And if knight g1... To so just step out of the way. Very often that can be a very good defensive move because it gets the, the knight out of danger here and protects h3. But actually in this case, black's attack will continue after this. In a sense, this is also exploiting the loose bishop on a6. And, well, obviously black um, is doing pretty well there. So in this position after queen f6, this was the last move played, Rook e3 supports the knight on f3. Um, it's actually possible to take on d4 here. But uh, actually, alpha 0 just wants to continue, uh, continue with the initiative. Uh, let me just show you very, very briefly. Basically, black is doing pretty well here because the rook is attacked and knight b4 is possible. And in fact... This would be uh, white's best continuation. White is the exchange down, but has two pawns for the exchange. Um, alpha zero probably, well, if anyone's for choice here, I would choose uh, go for black here. But it obviously felt that its winning chances weren't uh, sufficient in that variation. So it wanted to keep the initiative. That's a, it's a very interesting decision. Threatening mate. Defending mate, knight d5. Now, if the rook goes back, then this is a superior version of what we've just looked at. With a fork, this is very complicated, but basically this is a lot of fun for black. Uh, you can see that you know there are still problems with the bishop, still problems here and here. Black has a very nice position. And who knows, some kind of sacrifice at some point here could be good. Let's go back. So knight d5, bishop b5. So that bishop has been a problem. It's loose on a6. And putting it on b5, of course, uh, shields the pawn on b2. But black's initiative continues. And well, in playing like this, of course, this was leaving the rook hanging. So black is the exchange up. But White has two pawns for it, and the game is absolutely alive. But interesting to see how these bishops still feature very prominently in the game. So this bishop comes here. It's tempting white into playing e4. The bishop will drop back, and actually this one comes into the game. So bishop c4. And once again, it's possible for... Alpha zero to simplify this position by taking on c4 and playing e4 here. And 
rook f8. Now, I just wonder whether it just felt that this bishop was just out of the game. And, well, this is extremely dangerous with potential threats here. But it might have just felt that this bishop isn't very good. It, it's very interesting how it, it values peace activity greatly. And instead of simplifying in that way, just drop the bishop here. Um, well, we, you might recall the first game that I demonstrated um, to, in this particular series. We had white's bishops on tucked away on b1 and b2 in that fantastic attacking game. Well, here they're tucked away in the other corner. Well, yeah, uh, the, in a sense the same corner, but um, with, with colours reversed. Just really interesting to see. A5, but a very unclear position still on the board. But it's all about that initiative. And Alpha Zero steps up again. Threatening the pawn here and threatening the pawn on A5. So White is losing one of them. B4. Stockfish decides to keep the advanced pawns on the queen side, but obviously things have gone black's way here. So it's now only one pawn. Still complicated. So this keeps the king bottled in. That's that's important. So it's still kind of its eye on the enemy king, actually. And now this one pops out for a moment. Bishop returns. And now b5. So, uh, well, this is impossible to take because it, the rook would be deflected from defending the bishop. Can't do that. So the bishop goes back. But the point is that these pawns, they are no longer protected. The, uh, the b-pawn doesn't protect the a-pawn. So they're a little bit loose. And even playing to b7 rather than a8 is tempting this pawn forward and then this bishop will come more into the game it's very interesting to see and the potential idea of playing c6 and this one might even come into the game on this diagonal watch out for that um, but having tempted this pawn forward then this bishop is able to run out And queen g3 it goes for an end game, but an end game where white has to be quite careful. Obviously, its king is shot in for the moment, so it's essential that white goes for the pawn on g3. But in the meantime, it'll be possible for black to attack on the other side of the board. So let's see how this works out. So the rook is able to come in and white manages to get this pawn, very important. But there is enormous pressure here. And now there we go, this bishop, bishop? <laughs> bishop pops out to hit c3. Uh, this was always going to be the case when um, this this bishop was was given room. So finally, White has to acquiesce to the exchange of rooks, which he doesn't really want to do. But this rook is so strong on the second rank in combination with the rook here. But this is uh, one of the the basic rules of endgame play. If you're the exchange up. And you have, say, two rooks against rook and knight. If you can exchange the rooks, that is usually an achievement. Or two rooks against rook and bishop. Ex if you're the exchange up, exchange rooks. It makes it much, much easier to play. So I think at this point, the writing is definitely on the wall. Although it's still very, very tricky. And obviously, the far advanced pawns need to be handled carefully. But... Uh, at least, you know, the, the, this bishop can, can take care of them on its own at the moment. And that gives 
Black's Rook the chance to rampage on the other side of the board. I mean, it, it, it's not clear to me whether objectively this is a, a winning position, actually. Um, here, White uh, Stockfish played Bishop D1. Um, I wonder about Knight F1 um, to put the Knight here. But, well, in any case, Bishop D1 played. And E3 is a strong move, obviously, deflect, trying to deflect the king away from the knight. And the rook is able to take on d4. And now things are, I think, pretty clear. And it, it's kind of a mopping up operation. The king goes back. And now d3, which means that black can take on b5. Now, this game actually goes on for a very long time, but round about here, I think basically we can we can call off the fight. Um, I mean, I think this is what uh, uh, traditional chess engines are very, very good at, and that's defending. And so uh, Stockfish managed to put up fantastic resistance, but effectively the game didn't change at all and little by little alpha zero crept over uh, if, if you'll forgive me i don't wish to look at the remaining 34 moves uh, 33 moves of this game i beg your pardon uh, but basically alpha zero crept forward and, and well i'll show you the, the final position that's the final position um, the king has managed to sneak in and the writing is on the wall here. But, yeah, for me, the, the main part of that game is early on where this incredible move, knight e7, was played. Um, just an amazing concept. And I just wonder, um, well, how many humans would play that move? Or how many top chess engines would play that move either? It's a fantastic concept. Um, do check out the other games that I've recorded um, f featuring AlphaZero and Stockfish. You'll find the playlist above there. And uh, if you're not a subscriber, then click on the subscribe button down there. And if you'd like to support the channel, then check out the links up there. Patreon.com, PowerPlayChess, or one of donations on PayPal would be very much appreciated. Thanks for your help. Bye now.